Okay. It's preparing to live stream, so wait for a second, please, while it sets up. All right, okay. So I think it's now live on YouTube, so um, you can share your screen, Chris, and yep. carry on. Right. Um, right. I can maybe just get a nod from someone that you guys can see the screen. Yeah, we can we can see. Uh, it's not in uh, presenter mode. So. Yeah. Yes, now it's in presenter mode. Thanks. Match found. Great. Well, thanks thanks for joining everyone. Um, so I I'm I'm Chris Burrell, and I'll introduce myself uh, in a in a second. But just for as a reminder for those who've been kind of listening in, um, we've been we will be talking about um, microservice architectures, which are uh, a high level, a, a way of building a platform um, and lots of different people use it from, from startups and enterprises and, and we'll, we'll visit a little bit of the, the different challenges that we might have. Uh, some kind of common challenges through um, just setting up any kind of project, but then actually focusing specifically on, on the four microservices, what are the kind of the types of challenges you might encounter in either common things or stuff that appears as a result of uh, having uh, microservice uh, architectures. Uh, just a bit about me and Landbay before before I start. So Landbay was founded in 2014, so a reasonably uh, recent company. Uh, we started in peer-to-peer -peer finance, so people like you and me could put £100 up and we would um, uh, lend it to, to a landlord uh, and um, the landlord would buy a property. Um, and then we pivoted uh, three, four years ago so that we now work with very large institutions, so think big banks who've got, say, £100, £200 million pounds to deploy. And so we all match uh, big funds to um, to to, people, to landlords who who have got properties to rent. Uh, there's about 150 staff. The tech team's somewhere between 25 to to 35 uh, engineers, depending on how you count it. And that that will become uh, a little bit more relevant uh, later. And we host around 50 microservices um, on AWS. Um, and uh, we've got a little bit of serverless stuff, which I understand you either have or will be looking at uh, also. Um, and we're a cloud native organization, so we didn't move anything from uh, an office space or a data center. Uh, we, we started in the cloud, um, and so we're able to leverage uh, cloud technologies straight up. Um, I've been at Land Bay uh, seven years. Uh, my details there, if you want to get in touch with me um, at a later date, um, feel free. Um, and prior to, to Land Bay, uh, where I'm the CTO and grew the tech team, um, I had uh, seven years of consultancy with a company called Detica. Um, so I looked at large projects like the EE Shop or Three or Vodafone, uh, some of the big uh, projects there, and also worked for government projects for kind of fraud detection systems on borders. So different different bits of uh, experience there, but primarily on the kind of architecture and uh, development side. Uh, so let's go straight in. Um, so I understand you guys have just started um, looking at microservices. And so the, the way the talk works and the lecture is uh, we'll look at some of the kind of foundational uh, principles of what microservices are. And some of that you may have covered. So uh, feel free to interrupt me and I'll, I'll go a little bit fast on that. Uh, then we'll kind of cover the grounds of if you're starting a, a new, microserv uh, new microservice platform from scratch, uh, some of the architect architectural concepts that you might need to look at from there. Um, and then we'll move on to kind of more enterprise type uh, microservices at scale um, and some of the challenges that you get there. Um, so, so fundamentally, uh, what is a microservice? Um, it's a, uh, the, the easiest way probably of defining it is that it's a small uh, discrete piece of software that you can deploy uh, independently and together with lots of independent pieces of software that will build up a platform. So for Landbay, uh, we primarily have brokers who want to submit mortgages and we've got funders who want to lend money on the platform. So we've got 50 distinct pieces of software that we can deploy individually. They'll all talk to each other in the different ways. They each have their own databases. They each have their own queues to, to send messages to one another. They've each got their own JVM. They're totally independent bits of software. Um, and together as a whole, they deliver functionality. Um, and some functionality will be delivered by just one microservice. So for example, we might have a, an authentication service, which sole job is to authenticate people, uh, but other times microservices will need to collaborate together to deliver uh, bits of functionality um, together. 
Um, so this is a, a diagram I stole offline, uh, online from, from the internet from Uber. Um, I suspect their architecture is a lot more complicated than this, uh, but it was quite a good illustrative um, thing where they've got, say, a passenger a UI, so a, a web interface, a driver web interface, bottom left there. Um, and then they've got a service just to manage passengers. So presumably their request for, for calling up an Uber um, and then a service to manage drivers uh, and then a service to manage trips. And so you could envisage the kind of trip service to, to have to talk to driver management and passive management services. And eventually there'll be connections to, to billing from the trip to, to log the trip um, to, together. And then the, the billing will send invoices out and the invoices might be settled through payments. And then you'll get notifications from your web app, from your email, et cetera. And so, together as a whole you've got the kind of uber uh, platform um, but each individual service has got a very discrete uh, piece of functionality uh, if i just rewind a couple of slides um, where we used to be um, when when software first kind of came about um, if you kind of think big mainframe type uh, software uh, used to be on the monolith side of things so you've got one uh, piece of software it gets deployed um, and, and there are very big advantages to that, uh, but some of the, the disadvantages is if you need to make a fix to it, you're having to deploy uh, the whole thing. And so I think hearsay uh, suggests that for, for Amazon, who are a big pioneer of, of microservices, it took them somewhere between a week to two weeks to release uh, a new release of the platform, which, which is incredibly a long time if you're keen to, to leverage your features very quickly. And then kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, moved over to something called server, so service oriented architecture. Um, and that's the idea of separating your business. So um, I did a bit of consultancy for the AA. And so there, for example, you might have their, their Rosetta uh, review system that might be you know, one, one part of the business. Um, and then you might have you know, the whole uh, road traffic um, help side of things. That's another part of the business, but they're quite discrete. So there may be some interactions between them, um, but not, not that many. Uh, with a microservice architecture, you'll get lots of interactions all of the time, uh, and the services are really, really, really small. Um, so obviously, lots of people like to, to demonstrate what um, those look like. Um, so those are kind of generated uh, pictures from, from Amazon and from Netflix. Um, and whilst they, I, I think they look particularly ugly, but they, they think they look quite, quite good. And they show the complexity of it, of microservices. So you've got lots and lots of different services um, in, in black or or orange on Amazon side and then green on Netflix, and then each service kind of connects to each other. So you can see straight away that at scale, uh, microservices are very, very difficult to, um, to manage effectively because there's going to be um, thousands, if not tens of thousands of microservices for very large organizations. On the other hand, you can see straight away that if you need to replace a service, you're only going to replace a tiny part of the platform, which is where some of the advantages um, come in. Um, a slightly easier to read, but just as unhelpful diagram. Uh, this is the one for Landbay. Uh, and again, you can see all the interactions. Um, you can see the little cats, which are Tomcat containers, so web containers. Um, each of those might have different databases, which are the little dolphins there for MariaDB and little rabbits for the queues. Uh, but essentially, they'll communicate to, to each other. Um, and um, as someone just looking at traffic going on from one server to another between containers, um, the traffic is going to be very, very chatty because you've got lots and lots of components uh, to your microservice uh, platform. So just one example, and this is from our um, a monitoring solution. A broker might be logging into our portal. Um, it's on the left-hand side there, um, and um, it might make a request to um, uh, place a case with us, so, um, so to find a, a mortgage. Um, and then the mortgage, obviously, they'll need to select a mortgage product, um, a rate, and um, how many years they want the mortgage for. And as part of that, we might need to take some decisions on what products are available, because if you've got more deposit or less deposit, products may or may not be available. And so you can see that even for a very simple use case here, uh, we've got um, one, two, three uh, different services involved, or four if you include the, the portal up front. Um, and you can see, um, perhaps if I manage to get rid of this little guy here, um, you can see from the, the side up here um, that you've got 161 millisecond response time, which you know is reasonably quick, certainly compared to some of the, uh, the other uh, architectures out there. 
across four hops. And if you compare the uh, average time spent in the called services, which is you know Java time uh, processing time, uh, compared to the average response time, you can see you've already lost 11 uh, milliseconds, which um, in the grand scheme of things is quite small, um, but it is about 10-ish, um, 12% of, of the call. Um, so, so there are some disadvantages. Here's just another account, uh, another uh, use case. Uh, for example, someone pays um, that might go to an account service instead of the other ones that we've just seen. Uh, brokers have got accounts, so you might need to go through the broker um, uh, service to find out who the broker is so that they can pay. Um, so again, um, here you can see this one took 86 milliseconds, a single request, but actually ended up with two database calls and two services across the wire for um, HTTP calls to each of the Tomcat services. So to put it in context, there's some, there's some big advantages to microservices. Um, the, there's a, certainly a faster time to market. So a lot of companies will adopt microservices because they're very, very quick uh, to deploy a service. It's quite small. Um, Amazon coined the phrase a kind of two pizza team. So their, their teams are the size it would take to eat two pizzas. So you think four, five, six people, but probably nearer the smaller end. Um, and the idea would be within a sprint or two, so two to four weeks, you might be able to re, uh, rebuild a microservice. Um, and different people have different, um, uh, different theories about how big or smaller a service should be. But the key thing is if the service is small, it starts up very quickly. There's very few tests, automated tests, or even perhaps uh, manual tests to run. And if you've got lots of automation, then actually you can get this service live very, very quickly. And so your feature starts to pay back the investment you've made uh, to, to your employer or to the company that you're working for, or the consultant you're working for uh, very quickly. Um, they are, however, quite a lot harder to deploy. Um, so typically, you know, monolith applications, organizations might deploy once a quarter I mean, they might have invested in some automation but because there's only one or two things it's very quick to uh, to deploy it might be a few clicks on on a web logic interface which is like a, an enterprise uh, web container with containers um, and dockerized um, software you'll need to package up this, uh, the software you'll need to store it in the docker registry um, somewhere you'll need to link your cloud or your data center to the docker registry You'll need an orchestrator um, to pull that image. You'll need to tell the orchestrator to deploy it. You'll need to tell it how many um, uh, microservices of that particular kind you want. You'll need to define whether you want um, all the uh, original services to stay in place while you deploy the new service. So there's quite a lot of complexity here in terms of managing 50, 60, 70 items uh, rather than one or two. But that does push you towards uh, automated deployments. Um, and so if you automate one service, hopefully most services follow the same pattern. Um, and so then you can start deploying 50 services the same way, 60 services the same way. So it's one investment. Uh, whereas if you've only got one service, a lot of companies have found they don't invest in the automation. Some steps remain manual because actually in, in the grand scheme of things, the, the automation doesn't pay. Um, and so, so that's, that's where you've had a move recently from a, a kind of much more Java type jobs, infrastructure jobs, um, very much into the kind of DevOps where the developers and the ops people who manage servers are, are similar. Another big advantage is architecturally. And certainly when you are um, getting more and more senior or you're investing or you're founding a company, what you're looking for in software is the kind of long-term. Um, your a typical startup might do a proof of concept, but eventually, you kind of want the software to be lasting three, four, five, six years. Um, you don't really want to be um, having to rebuild the entire platform. And so with a monolith um, where you've only got one piece of software, things get entangled quite quickly. Some people take shortcuts, there's um, pressures, time pressures, deadlines, etc. And so you may take some shortcuts. Um, whereas with a microservice architecture, uh, you're kind of forced to think about what are the boundaries of a particular microservice. Um, what are, how, how do we extend it? How do we, uh, how does it integrate with the rest of the platform? But by defining the boundaries, um, you allow it to be extended. So um, you're allowed to be replaced. You can just replace. So say you've got a contract between service A and B. In order to replace service A, you just need to abide by the same contract, but you can rewrite it from Java to Python to grade uh, to, to Groovy or, or whatever. Your language of the of the day is um, in terms of testing. It's a lot easier because they're just a lot smaller. 
Um, and so, again, if you're going to rewrite significant bits of it or internals or algorithms within that particular service, um, you don't have thousands and thousands of tests, you might have a few hundred. Uh, and finally, if your, your business shifts position, then you can just switch bits off on, on your architecture rather than having to redeploy or disentangle. Um, and interestingly, if you've looked into uh, static code analysis, um, which is a key, key part of, of a lot of builds where they kind of look at the code to see how safe it is. Um, typically, one of the metrics you get out is something called package entanglement. Um, and it looks at, in particular in Java, how many classes rely on packages and how many of those packages rely on the original packages. And so how many tangles do you have through the code? Um, and so with microservices, by de facto not sharing the JVM, the container, any particular code together, you remove that straight away. And so from a long-term perspective, that becomes a lot easier. Um, I've mentioned a couple others at the, at the bottom. It's much easier to have multiple teams working on, on services. So if you've got 50 services, we've got four teams at Land Bay. Um, and so it is obviously then a lot easier to have some people work on some services and other people work on other services. And so particularly from a support perspective, um, rather than having uh, support teams like uh, companies used to have, uh, you can then segregate saying, okay, these services here are belonging to this team, which the, the, the benefit of that is to then empower that team to make continual changes to make those services even easier and uh, easier to, to, to maintain, to support, to extend uh, in the long term. And so you kind of put the onus and the responsibility back into the hands of those people who uh, built it in the first place. Uh, and that, that cycle often is is overlooked. Um, but if you're going to fix the service that you're putting live, then obviously you're going to be spending a bit more time making sure uh, the quality of that is is higher. Uh, scaling is, is one that a lot of people will say. Um, it's certainly true if you're at the kind of Amazon, Twitter, um, Netflix scale. Um, typically on small environments, I suspect mostly you don't benefit from that because containers still run on servers and the servers are still shared by all the containers. And so as you scale one or two containers, they'll depend on other containers. And so whilst you, you will get some benefit, um, it's not necessarily at the top of the list on, on there. There are serious disadvantages though in microservices. Um, so if you read online, lots of people are really, really excited about microservices, but if you try and read through that excitement, um, you will get lots of voices saying it's not necessarily the platform of choice for everything. Um, so that, like we said, there's a lot more to deploy. So we'd have 50 microservices to deploy on a new environment, for example. Um, and if you think about it, there's a lot more boilerplate code. So between our 50 microservices that talk to each other, we have to have code that um, talks to each of the services. Um, if you think about it also, there's a lot more complexity. If something goes wrong in a, in a service, what happens to the services that were calling it? What happens to the services that are downstream that never get called? Um, and finally, if you, if you look at a production system and you're investigating a bug um, where you've got less visibility, you've got a few logs, but you can't put um, debug points and, and, and breakpoints and so on, then you're going to have to have some mechanism of working out where the issues are. Um, and so the more microservices you have, obviously the more uh, hay you've got and where's the where's the needle in that, that haystack. And finally, there's a lot more network traffic. Um, as services become more and more chatty, um, then you're going to waste time uh, in network latency, which is not generally a big issue in a data center, but certainly if you start going down the multi-cloud, so host stuff on both say Azure, GCP and AWS, because you'll say a large bank with financial regulations or something, then you're going to have um, some kind of more interesting latency type problems to, to resolve. Uh, so there are some serious disadvantages, but generally the advantages of being fast to market um, and protecting the long-term viability of the services um, is a really, really good thing. Uh, so if we look at um, this side of things, it just highlights if you look at all of the the boxes here in yellow, you've got the uh, the bits so that could either go wrong or the boilerplate code. So case management here uh, talks to mortgage product service. So there's code in case management that wouldn't necessarily need to be there if mortgage product service and case management service were the same thing. And then you've got extra complexity around load balances and network latency um, in the middle also. 
Um, and, and often also with microservices, um, and I found this time and again um, with conversation around the office, um, we, we come across gray and, and gray answers are often satisfactory. Um, we often like in, in the engineering sphere, something either works or it doesn't work. Um, if, if you have to suddenly look at trade-offs, um, then, then that's difficult. And within microservices, you often have to make trade-offs. Um, so for example, the best algorithms will probably work a lot better within a single service where there's no network communication with anything else. Um, but as soon as you introduce network communication, potential network failures, then you're, then you're faced with, with the question, well, do you want the better algorithm? Do you want the faster algorithm? Do you want the more elegant algorithm? Do you want the one that's more supportable? Do you want the one that's um, uh, the cheapest to run? Do you want the one that's the fastest to code? Um, and so we'll probably time and again come across this and certainly as you make your own decisions on on how big microservices should be um, you'll have to keep coming back to what are we trying to achieve here what's the actual business outcome rather than what's the technical elegance of any particular solution and so common questions will be how many microservices should we have how big or small uh, should they be um, and a lot of that comes down to how do you cut services and a lot of that is is art um, rather than necessarily engineering. Uh, but some experience helps. Um, I, I've come across two uh, particular patterns that have helped us. Um, one is um, data services, uh, or what I'm calling data services, so more kind of domain-driven design. Um, so if you think of the Uber side of things, it's more what, what are your fundamental data structures? Um, your, you know, you, maybe you've got a car and you need to be managing your, your cars. You've got your your authorizations for your drivers, you've got your transactions, etc. For Land Bay, that would be a, a broker, a mortgage, um, a, a transaction, etc. Or you can cut your services into feature services. So a feature might be calculating interest at the end of the month. And, and depending on which way you go, you it will help you cut the services. And so generally, your feature services might use uh, data services. So to illustrate that, I think I've got a an example here. So the one in green here, interest calculation, is more like a feature uh, service. Its sole responsibility is to grab data from everywhere else, um, and then from everywhere else, calculate a bit of interest and say to the rest of the platform, there's some interest. Whereas the blue services here um, manage data. So for example, the account service might manage how much money someone's got. The investment service might manage the link that our funders, big institutions, have got to which loans. Um, and so as we calculate interest from our borrowers and we pay our funders, we kind of need to know the link, the base rate. The Bank of England's made the news a lot recently. They set the interest rates uh, that, that um, big funders can borrow at. And so we'll record that. And so the interest calculation will then grab lots of data um, from, say, a base rate service, it will grab all the links between the funders and the investments they've made, and it will grab all of the balances they've got. Um, it will calculate some interest, um, and then it might send some payments to be credited, again, perhaps here to, to the account service, or perhaps it, if there's lots of um, lots of transactions because of you know, heavy investments, maybe it puts on some cloud native storage that gets picked up. But, but the concept here being, a combination of those two types of services are generally a good way of, of thinking about a platform. Um, so you've got your intrinsic pieces of data, you know, a mortgage, a set of accounts, uh, an investment, a funder, a base rate, etc. Uh, but then you've got your features, logging in, interest, uh, viewing a dashboard, um, searching perhaps across the whole platform. Um, and fundamentally, and, and finally, um, just on this kind of introductory session on the, the microservice, it, it does um, change the way, the mindsets of organizations. So we don't have an Anbay, a DevOps team. We don't have a database administrators. We don't have a support team. We don't have a QA team. Uh, because fundamentally, the microservice that we deploy, the automation we've built to deploy the microservices, the build scripts, all of that kind of stuff, and the databases, they're all in the hands of engineers. And that, I think, makes a, a much more interesting job. Uh, certainly more varied. It's not just a Java. You come in the morning, code, and go home. Uh, but you'll think of the full life cycle, uh, but does have accountability. So if you deploy something rubbish into production, then you're probably the one who will pick it up. And so there's that kind of cycle there on the, on the right-hand side. Um, you kind of plan, you code, you build, you test. 
and then it kind of goes more on the ops side. So you start releasing, you deploy, uh, you operate it. In other words, you kind of troubleshoot um, and then you uh, monitor and that goes back to plan ideally. And so by combining the teams, then I think you have much more uh, synergy within the team to own and make things better uh, rather than uh, uh, what you often get in large organizations who, who haven't you know, adopted this pattern recently. And you'll have the dev team, they chuck it over the fence to the testers. The testers say it's all good, so they chuck it over the fence to the ops team. The ops team try and install it, doesn't quite work, so it kind of goes all the way back. And, and you lose a lot of time in there, um, and generally lot, you get lots of kind of security and authorization issues between who can do what. Um, so um, typically, um, microservice type platforms will have a little bit more cohesion between your kind of ops operations and dev operations generally within the same person, but it doesn't necessarily exclude very specialist skills. So that's possibly all I want to say in terms of what microservices are, but I'm happy to either take questions now or, or keep going on how we would then start building a, a microservice platform from, from scratch. Yeah, maybe it's a good time to stop and ask about if there are any basic questions about how to architect microservices or how to approach the architecture of microservices. If anyone has any questions, just shout or uh, raise your hands and then or place in the chat. And then I can, if you type into the chat, I can ask the question on your behalf if, if you're feeling more comfortable to do that. Well, well, people are thinking of questions if they have any questions. Oh, there is one question already. So the first question is, you've mentioned that each microservice has its own database. Is that important or can many use the same database? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so what we do at Lambay is we've got one, well, we've actually got two database servers um, shared across the 50 microservices, but each service only has access to its own schema. So the investment service only has access to the investment um, schema, which only has got tables within, within there. And the account service can't have a look at what the investment service has. And I, I would say that is that is almost fundamental um, and foundational. And, and the real reason is if you start having a look at what other people have got in their other databases, what you're essentially doing is creating a dependency. So you're creating a dependency between service A is expecting to find table in service B, which then means service B can't just decide to drop that table, change that table, change columns, etc. And so your independence is gone. Uh, the beauty of using a REST API or asynchronous messaging to abstract that away means that you can agree on a contract uh, between those services and we're going to come on to some of that. Um, but then that service can decide to implement things in whichever way it likes. Um, so if it wants to move away from, say, a MySQL database or MariaDB and use Elasticsearch or Mongo, then it can do that. And any consumers of that service can uh, be continuing to use it totally transparently. They don't really need to care about what language is used, what um, databases use, et cetera. I guess in finance, you might even have some uh, regulations as to isolation between different parts, such as I know the, the investment part of a bank, for example, can't be uh, coexisting with the savings side of the bank, for example. Yeah, that's right. And so um, sometimes you'll be able to leverage that from a service perspective. So you architect the data being very separate. Um, and that's quite good if you have auditors coming in, you can give them access to some parts of the data without seeing other parts of the data. Um, some of that can also just be achieved through um, various bits of security. So just permission systems for some users logging on the system, having more visibility over another. Yep. Very good. Any questions? So there's one more question. Uh, oh, there are a few more questions, actually. Uh, so the second question uh, is about if the microservices are controlled by just one service, how would that one service, how much would that one service really need to do apart from monitoring and maintain? Yes, I'm not quite sure what we mean by maintain, but just one service. But essentially, you might have multiple microservices in the, in the platform. Um, and if the service is only ever called by one other service, then you, you've got a legitimate right to question why it's its, its own service, um, absolutely. 
Um, on the flip side, there may be reasons that you think in the future you might want to be able to easily replace something. Um, the, the, the monitoring and the maintaining side of things is more down to the people aspects and the activities around that. So does your team want to support 100,000 different services or one or two? And obviously the, the answer is you want to support as few services as possible, which is why uh, generally is where the tech started uh, when uh, automation is not so good, clouds aren't available, uh, compute isn't elastic. Uh, you have fewer moving parts and therefore your bits of software are much, much larger. With, mm -hmm. with automation, um, you can make things a lot smaller because you've got automation to, to help you along. Um, but but yeah, so I, I'd agree with, if you've only got a few different services and service A talks to service B, service B talks to service C, there's probably not a, a big reason not to merge them. But the question is more about what you want to do architecturally by replacing them in the future. Um, so for example, you might have a different type of customer where it'd be nice for your customer service to be um, separate. So you can just have different variants of customer and abstract that away from all the services that don't care about the type of customer you have. Um, I, message I is, lot, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just, just to elaborate on that, I guess one of the, maybe uh, Jack, you can you can confirm if this, this is what you meant, is if there's one microservice that's monitoring all the other microservices, can it be just a monitoring microservice rather than it that other that monitoring service all being other other tasks to do? Is is that is that part of what you meant, Jack? Or the the answer is already satisfying. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. So the, the idea is that is is there going to be if there's going to be one monitoring microservice, how um can that be just a monitoring yeah. microservice? How do you anticipate that that would also have other tasks to do? Yeah, so so typically monitoring isn't generally done with, well, I guess you could argue it's a microservice, but is it isn't typically done by microservices themselves. So uh, if you look out there, um, open source solutions like um, uh, Grafana and Prometheus uh, as its database, or uh, CloudWatch, um, or if you go for commercial solutions, uh, CloudWatch is an open source, that's the AWS version but open um, commercial solutions like Dynatrace or New Relic or Datadog, there's, there's loads. What, what generally happens is you put an agent on the server that just runs in the background. So you could theoretically call it a microservice that pulls stats from all services. Um, so those drawings that you saw uh, near the early part of the, um, the, the, the slides, um, the each microservice is giving stats um, the agent that we run on our servers instruments code. So in, in Java, it will put little bits on, on, on bits of code that it thinks will be executed lots and lots of times. It will put, it will alter the bytecode just to inject a, a, a catch of when it goes into the method, when it goes out, and that allows you to time it and that allows you to trace um, code through. So typically monitoring per se is, is generally handed out because if, if people have invented a wheel, let's use their wheel rather than reinvent it. Um, so I hope I hope that helps. Yeah, I I, I think what, one of the things which might also be useful for for them, especially for the report, is what visualization were you using for those um, graphs that you were. Yeah, so those particular graphs come straight out of our Dynatrace solution. Um, but if you want to use something similar, I don't know what Azure has, which I know that you guys use. Um, AWS has got X-Ray. Um, you'll get, if you look up free tier on AWS, there'll be plenty of hours uh, there. Um, there's uh, a solution, which the name has just escaped me. Um, but if you look at Apache APM on Google, um, it will come up Skywalker or Skywalking, uh, one of those two. That's an open source uh, solution around um, distributed tracing um, and um, application mm -hmm. performance monitoring. So there's plenty of um, solutions out there um, to, to help. Um, typically, what happens is your, your solution of choice will give you an agent to run on your server, uh, which will then you, you run and it does the rest for you. It gets some stats, sends it off to um, a monitoring solution out the door, um, out of the box, sorry. In terms of REST versus async, we'll come back to that. Um, I've got some slides later on that. Um, and then different schemas in the same DBMS. Um, yes, so that's absolutely right. So um, the, the purest microservice person would say you want a different database server um, for a different microservice. That becomes very, very expensive very, very quickly um, because 
um, well, because you're paying for lots and lots of compute. Uh, so typically what people will do is group them by maintaining the independence of schemas. So to the question that I think Jamie had earlier, you're making sure that uh, service A doesn't look at service B's database. And so actually moving that database away from uh, a particular server to its own server allows you to scale that server. Um, so that's one of the reasons we've got two servers um, at Landbay with about 50 schemas on, the, on them. Um, but we, we, we're we not a high volume um, kind of, you know, Black Friday. No one logs on on a Black Friday to apply for a mortgage. Um, but um, in, in a theoretical world, when we, you know, launch a new product, a very good rate, you might have an influx of people and so you might need to scale. Um, but yeah, so typically what you'll do is you'll start with the independence built in so that you can scale out uh, when you need to. Thanks. I think that covers most of the questions. Maybe it's time to carry on and the other yep. questions can come towards the end. Yeah, great. Um, cool. So on any project, uh, you'll need to um, decide um, how to, to work together as a team. And some of these bits, I'll just skip through them more for, for reference. But obviously, um, the vast majority of the world uses Git, unless there's other reasons to GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. I think, sorry, I've got their own um, Git repository also. A uh, Gitflow we'll cover in a minute, but that's a we need to agree as a team how we're going to work together. Um, choosing a good IDE. Um, if you want a top tip for any interviews, whether with Landbay or whether any other company, if they're asking you to do a, a coding exercise, um, know your IDE. Some people do it live, um, and so having a good experience of that is is vital. And then obviously MRs, so merge requests or pull requests or squash commits, which is where you kind of get one commit and squash it all into one. But in order to keep the, the commit tree uh, really easy to, to read. Um, fundamentally, with microservices, things get a little bit easier. So uh, people used to, to look at something called Gitflow, which is which is on the screen, where you've got code in master, you might merge off, make a hot fix, merge it back in. So that's the, the second branch from the right here. Uh, or generally, you work off develop, a branch called develop and eventually that gets back into release branch and eventually there's a few fixes etc and it gets back into master now that's really really good uh, for complicated things but one of the benefits of microservices is generally that uh, not many people work on the same services because you've distributed everything out um, and so that becomes a lot simpler um, so at Landbay, we use something called feature branches, which is obviously, as you can see, you've got your feature branch here where you kind of merge off develop. We just merge master off feature branch and merge that back into master. And so you skip all of the bit in the middle because microservices can be deployed independently. That means that even if I've only built half of a feature, um, say I've built the bit that stores balances, but I haven't built the bit that um, triggers a balance to increase or decrease. I can still push that into live because it's not going to affect anything. It's not going to break anything. It's tested, et cetera. And so our, um, on the right-hand side, you can see how it looks when there's a really, really busy project. Uh, but on the left-hand side, you can see this is a very typical uh, service of ours. You look at the commit history. It's very, very um, clean. It's, you've got one or two branches and you can see they kind of merge off, merge in, merge off, merge in. But fundamentally, the, the key thing here is decide with your team how you're going to, to do uh, things with Git. Uh, because if you don't, what you end up is um, with a bit of a mess. Um, and, uh, and the bit that I had uh, here, never break master. Um, generally, what we have is anything that hits master goes into production. Uh, we've got automation that takes code and within six to eight minutes, it's in production. And so we don't want to break master because that really affects everyone else who's working on the same services. Um, you'll need task tracking of some kind. So GitHub, GitLab, Jira, Jira they, they've all got that. Um, and you need to decide how you work within Sprints or Scrum or Kanban. But uh, I won't cover that in terms of microservices so, so much. Um, but that's just part of setting up any, any software project. Um, build tracking. Um, and this is where the automation starts to, to become vital. Um, you choose early on what you want to, to build your software, whether it's Maven or Gradle. Um, I would suggest against Ant. I know some universities are still advertising that as a, as a good tool. And it is, it's a good tool for what it is, but very few people um, in the industry use it uh, because it's very long-winded um, and it's quite quite long to, um, to debug um, and, and quite old. Um, 
but build tools wise, loads of free tiers on a lot of this stuff, or you can host it yourself. Um, we used to use Jenkins. We've now moved to, to GitLab, um, GitHub Actions, build stuff for you. Both GitLab and GitHub Actions have got three minutes that you can um, sign up for and it will build your code for you. Um, but essentially something uh, to, to build your code. And the idea being the build should cover your um, packaging up your Java, um, running your unit tests, perhaps running some integration tests, um, and then ideally deploying it somewhere, whether it's to a server or an orchestrator uh, like ECS or Kubernetes. With microservices, the, the beauty here is you ideally write it for one of your projects, and then you share as much of that automation as possible. And there'll be a few exceptions, so your front end might be built in, in React or Angular, and so it might not share quite the same automation as everything else. Um, but ideally, most of your other services can. Um, if for whatever reason your team, someone goes Java, someone goes Groovy, someone goes Scala, someone goes React, then you've kind of lost a lot of the, the benefits that come from sharing the automation and, and reusing all of that good stuff for microservices at scale. Uh, I did have a, a candidate applying to Lambe once who wanted to um, write all their unit tests in Groovy. Um, but write the rest of the uh, code in Java. And we didn't quite understand, but that's hard from a recruiter's perspective because ideally you want one set of skills that you can then get lots of depth from rather than lots of varied skills, but actually not a huge amount of depth. Um, and then two questions. We've mentioned monoglot versus polyglot. So which languages are you going to build in? So one of the beauties of microservices is you can have some services in Go, some services in Rust, some services in Java. Um, for, for reasons um, of wanting most developers to be able to support most services, uh, at Lambay, we've mostly got Java and Python. So Python mostly on the data front um, and Java on, uh, on the back end, a bit of JavaScript uh, through Angular on the front end. Um, and then the other question typically is the monorepo versus multi-repo. So are you going to have one Git repository, or are you going to have many, many different repositories? Um, and so in particular here, uh, and Landbase done all three. Um, and so I'll quickly run through the, the main advantages and disadvantages. If you've got a small set of repositories, then you probably want to start with a, a monorepo, just subdirectories under each. Uh, and you still keep them independent. Um, but as you can imagine, it's much easier to then start thinking, oh, I'll just share a bit of code here. I'll just make a reasonable module there. Um, and suddenly, um, your independence might uh, disappear a little bit. Um, and certainly through tools like Maven, um, where it tries to work out the order of build, it might start building modules from different uh, parts of Microsoft architecture that are actually codependent um, and, and then actually create circular dependencies that you couldn't actually build those services on their own because they both rely on bits of the other services. But the benefits are the IDE is very good, except on very large projects. Um, and very easy to make sweeping changes, search and replace, or refactor through your ID, etc. Uh, code reviews are much easier as well because you've got your uh, your change requests, your your merge request or PR, and it captures all the changes. So that's nice. Um, you can kind of go through your your GitHub page, your your PR, and kind of see everything in um, at the same time. And that's one of the disadvantages with um, polyrepos, where each service will have its own repository, um, but your local development environment. Um, is also going to be a little bit harder. So rather than having to check out one repository, you have to check out five. And because you've got five, you have to keep all five in sync. Uh, and this is where the independence comes in. If you have to continually keep all five in sync, there's a piece of independence there that you haven't quite got. But the, the pro is you, by going through that pain, you realize where your services aren't totally independent um, and therefore where um, you might need to invest a little bit more in independence. Um, it's easier also to apply automation because automation is at the top level of a repository. So a commit is literally a change and a change therefore can be deployed rather than in monorepos where change might affect one service and not the other four. Um, and so which service would you have to deploy? So there's less work for a, a CI CD automation environment to, to build. And we've mentioned it ensures independence because obviously there's no other code in the repository. Um, some people, and we did go down this route, use Git submodules. Um, if you look online, um, should I use um, Git submodules? Um, everyone says it's a bad idea. Uh, within microservices, not so bad idea. It does provide a little bit of flexibility. So you can see at the very bottom, we've added a number of modules here. Um, and then you can 
say your your stuff is in node you can npm install across all git sub modules um so so there's a there's some good good examples of using that um we did use that after about nine months to a year it become really quite annoying um, and so we went from monorepos get some modules because didn't really quite want to lose all the benefits from monorepos but we ended up on polyrepos and that's because organizationally we've grown we've got 50 microservices it's very unlikely we're going to work on all 50. it's much more likely week on week we're working on two or three because we've got that segregation of which service should do what responsibility um and so the polyrepo definitely gets you thinking about how do you cut things more accurately whereas the monorepo is kind of wanting to have your cake and eat it but certainly if you've got five or six services um it's going to be a lot easier uh, people ask about shared code um we do have framework code at Landbay that we kind of share across multiple services and there's kind of advantages and disadvantages so obviously if you don't share the code, are you going to just copy and paste it? And that seems really counterintuitive to engineers who want to reuse and share and write once. On the other hand, the downside of sharing code is if you've got something you want to fix in your shared code and you've got 50 services relying on it, does that mean you're going to have to deploy 50 services? And a clever person says, no, 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 I can just um, deploy those five. But then what happens is he's forgotten service six to 10 and someone comes along next week and they deploy that service and pick up the shared code change. Uh, and unfortunately they don't know about the change. And so they're actually deploying something they, they didn't fully realize um, was, it wasn't just their change. It was a change from a, a coworker uh, a few weeks before. And so keeping framework small is what my, my personal recommendation is. I think some people online will just say, don't share anything at all. I think that probably is um, a little bit too um, black and white. But what we'll use it for is cross-cutting concerns. So setting up your databases, setting up connection pools to queues um, and so on. Um, and generally, we'll make it an a, a opt-in approach. So if there's lots of features, uh, we'll try and break them down in lots of different bits of framework so that not every service needs to bring in everything. Um, so keep it as small as possible um, and small as, uh, and as modular as possible so that if you do have to make a change, then you're not typically releasing code that you're not intending to. Uh, and finally, I mean, kind of the, um, the, the set of things you do when you first start a project, um, look at you know, frameworks, there's loads of frameworks out there, um, and, and I'll, I'll mention two or three on the next, next slide or two, but in microservices, some of the key things you want to be looking at is configuration. There's loads of configuration because you've got services talking to other services. So where are those services? What are the host names? Uh, what are the ports? Do you have timeouts for those? Um, logging, every service is going to need to log something. What are your different um, logging levels? Observability, we've mentioned, and monitoring. Um, when you deploy services, they're going to have to have health checks because your orchestrator is going to have to work out, is that service deployed and is it healthy? Um, I've mentioned the, the ones at the bottom and then um, coding style. Ideally, you want to kind of be able to read code from other co-workers. And the easiest way of doing that is to ensure you've got a certain level of kind of patterns that you adopt that are the same. So dependence injection, are you going to use reactive or non-reactive programming? Are you going to use JPA or SQL? Uh, some of the latest frameworks out there and um, we're using spring boot and we're starting to look at um spring native uh, in the background um plays also a good framework that's been mentioned a few times and then there's a number of frameworks like quarkus who are starting to um look at the growl vm which is a kind of java native vm rather than uh, compiling stuff into bytecode um, it compiles that to native code and we could do a whole other talk on that uh, but caucus is backed i think by red hat um and certainly that's probably going to gain quite a lot of um uh quite quite a lot of uh, momentum over the next few years but there's plenty of other frameworks outside of java also django for python etc um but but ultimately if you're going to do a set of microservices by choosing the same framework you ensure that any cross-cutting concerns you can code once um, and you can enforce the same way uh, I mentioned the build pipeline a few times just in passing, uh, but at the bottom there, you've got the pipeline as a whole. So we build our code, we do integration service testing, wrap it into a Docker image, push that to our registry. So for us, that's AWS on ECR, uh, but GitLab will provide you one for free. I'm sure GitHub's probably got one also. 
Um, we deploy a code to UAT and occasionally for very risky change, we might ask for manual um, approval for someone. So it gives time for people to test and we'll deploy it to production um, straight after that. So that typically takes five minutes end to end um, and generally don't have any manual in involvement. I'll just make a difference between the three. Continuous integration is where you would stop probably at step three here. So you might, or step four, you might push it to your uh, Docker registry, uh, but then that's where you stop. Uh, continuous delivery. Typically, some organizations will deliver stuff every two weeks, every four weeks. Um, so that, that will be the kind of continuous delivery model. Um, and so they break after step four, they package a whole host of changes together. Um, continuous deployments, and that's the one that Lambda uses, um, we will deploy as soon as that piece of code is ready. So your commits ready is going to live. Um, so um, I was looking earlier, I think we've got about five deployments a day for 20 people. Uh, and we'll deploy bits of features or whole features together, doesn't really matter, so long as it's tested from automation, um, we'll go straight through. Um, and so again, loads of tools, um, loads of um, free um, ways of doing it, um, GitHub Actions, uh, GitLab, Auto DevOps, we use GitLab internally. Um, but the main bit is integrate it to something like um, Team or Slack or, or whatever you use for your team, and don't let those builds fail. Uh, if if people start seeing lots and lots of failing builds, um, they just get fatigued, they start ignoring it, um, and and then your build system doesn't actually, even though it does what it's supposed to do on the tin, it doesn't have any of the good benefits that you're supposed to get from it, which is to keep your master branch clean and get stuff into, into production very, very quickly, which is one of the main benefits, again, of microservices. I've put this here just for, for reference, but you can see we use Amazon's Coretto uh, Java machine. Um, but I won't mention much on that. Um, and then next, I'm going to look at architecture concerns and we're going to look a little bit at some of the transactional side of things. Um, should we have a brief pause here or should I keep going? I realize I'm a little bit over. Um, I'm going to be quite a bit over, but I can. That's fine. I think there's one question that maybe we can take now, which is uh, if you share code, you don't limit your services to whatever language or framework um, that that shared library is written in, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So if you share your code, you can't uh, do that. And so that's some of the downsides. Um, from a, a business perspective, the question is, uh, do you want to, uh, would you, why would you want to uh, rewrite the same wheel multiple times um, purely from a, a cost-effective perspective? But you're right, absolutely right. A purist microservice person would have to rebuild authentication in Golang and in Java yeah. and et cetera. Um, and so uh, those are some of the downsides of, of microservices. And so this is where it's gray. Um, do you go purist view and it costs you a long, uh, a long, uh, um, a lot of money? And if you're a startup, you definitely don't have that. Uh, or do you mm -hmm. take some shortcuts? And it's the gray question of where do you take those shortcuts? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And that's an art, as you were saying earlier, which yep. shortcuts you take. Um, so the next question is about how do you go about measuring or monitoring like services performance and what sort of metrics would you use? Yeah, so good question also. Um, so a lot of the, the big boys out there with their monitoring solutions, as well as the free ones, will give you all of the kind of normal stuff of CPU type stuff, which Docker gives you out of the box um, latency, um, like how long does it take to get through a particular service? Um, typically the questions on monitoring Microsoft performance is more at the aggregate level. So why is it taking so long to log in? And that's because it's calling three or four services. Uh, so where you want to focus on is having some tooling in place to actually show you that uh, distributed trace. So things like Zipkin um, and open telemetry, um, uh, Grafana and Prometheus, um, Elasticsearch has got some of those bits uh, inbuilt uh, these days also. Mm -hmm. um, those things are trying to get all of the metrics. Um, if you want to look up open telemetry, it will give you a, a very full answer on this, where it kind of um, it breaks down each request in terms of a, a segment and it times the segment, says where the segment is in the overall um, request of four or five microservices. Um, but yeah, of course, that a lot of that will be um, centric to the the consumer so if you've got a very database performance heavy you'll want some database performance metric uh, monitors etc mm -hmm. yeah let, let me quickly go through yeah. some of the the architecture patterns um 
Uh, I, I'll try and skip through some of those reasonably quickly. Uh, but typically, um, the, the, there's two big patterns you need to think about. So API gateway and authentication, um, and we won't cover micro front ends, but the, the idea of micro front ends is to build uh, the front ends, rather than one front end, you build front end like your microservices. Um, and so you've got lots and lots of different um, front ends that you deploy rather than a single one. Um, doesn't seem to be widely adopted, but um, it's always worth, uh, worth mention. So the idea of an API gateway pattern is you stand up a, a microservice, typical microservice, normal microservice in front of the others so that you can centralize a whole host of concerns. And so to the questioner earlier, perhaps you don't, you, you can uh, have lots of microservices in lots of different languages uh, because you centralize some architectural concerns like security, like session management, um, and, and that service can take bits of JSON and merge them all together. So if you're doing a lot of that stuff in an API gateway type service, that service will query out because it's doing the security itself. Um, you won't need to then worry about what the services are doing. Um, there are other concerns like managing database connection pools and, and timeouts to, to queues and all those kind of things. You'll still need to do those if those services are doing it. Um, but the, the idea of the API gateway is very, very common in uh, microservice architecture and to put um, something in front of the services. Um, if you don't want to go that way, typically what people will do is use something called JWT, uh, JWT tokens, JavaScript web tokens, um, which is a piece of JavaScript which describes your scopes, your identification, your groups, your memberships, your permissions, and that gets passed to each service, and then each service is responsible for securing each point. Uh, so that's much better from a granularity perspective, but obviously it's marginally slower because each token needs to be verified to, to check it hasn't been tampered with um, and um, has to be done in each service. So we'll use a mix of it. Uh, where we need the granularity, we'll use something similar to, to JWT, um, but we do a lot of our security concerns up front and deny up near the, near the browser rather than uh, all the way down, um, down the stack of, of microservices. And finally, and someone mentions um, some of this around async, um, and we, we'll talk about it quite a bit more uh, shortly. But synchronous communications, HTTP, REST, GraphQL, um, well, one of the patterns obviously is asynchronous uh, messaging. So queues and topics, um, tools like RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, or Kafka, um, and other tools like AWS has got SNS. I'm sure, I, I think um, Azure is one that's just called messaging. Um, but how do you ensure that multiple services won't consume a message twice, um, but that you can actually deliver a message to multiple services? So for example, Microservice 2, Microservice 3 are both interested in something that Microservice 1 wants to talk about. Um, and so typically you use a topic, a topic fans out a message to all consumers. So in this case, consumers are queues, uh, but the queues make sure that the messages are only consumed once. So in this case, if Microservice 1 uh, puts a message on the, on the topic, then obviously microservice two and three will get a message only once. Um, and that means you can scale the number of microservices of each type uh, infinitely without risking duplication of messages or, um, or, or um, dual processing. So you wouldn't credit a balance twice, for example, or send an email twice. Um, another big thing in microservice architectures is contracts. Um, so Swagger, I've put some links there, but the open API spec allows you to define uh, uh, an endpoint in a way to say, here's what the URL should look like, here's some parameters. And the nice thing with this is that uh, you get a nice visual um, editor, uh, which describes it, but actually what we use it for is also to generate code. Um, and so suddenly, this is where all of this boilerplate code that is between different microservices is listening, as well as calling. Uh, we've used the online open source tools to generate code from those so that we don't need to write all these kind of heavily annotated um, uh, methods. And rather than worrying about, did we get the post right? Or is it a put or is it a get, um, et cetera? We can just simply uh, make sure we define the swagger correctly. The other benefit is as a team, you can define that swagger and the person doing the server bit, the person doing the client bit can actually just both work off their interface because of the independence of microservices, they don't need each other. Uh, you don't need to wait for the server before you can build a client. Um, so in, in that uh, side of things, that's um, a really good thing. Um, that's just a piece of Maven. If people are interested in trying it out, you'll need to remove the bits that say land bait, but on the whole, it should should work slightly older version 
Um, and I think if you look at open API Swagger uh, plugin, you'll probably find a, a later version from a slightly different community. Uh, but one of the best things of contract first is uh, that kind of collaboration side of things. Uh, and you can also make sure that you maintain backwards compatibility. Uh, so when you're looking at Git, you can see what, what the changes, but it's much clearer in a Swagger like um, spec in YAML um, to see what's changing in an interface rather than someone who's just tweaked a Java annotation and suddenly it's no longer get it, but it's a, it's a post, but the, the consumer never, was never told about that. Um, and so suddenly things don't work in, in production. And so what you then do, and certainly what we do in, um, in Lambay, um, and people do this bit in a different way, uh, we can use a tool called Swagger Diff. And again, there's probably two or three out there as part of the build. So um, as part of the build, service A goes into production, we're going to go and fetch the, the contract for service A in production. Uh, we'll use Swagger Diff. It will work out the differences between the production contract and the contract in the repository that we're building. And then it will highlight any issues um, that are uh, that are breaking. So if it's not backwards compatible, we'll fail uh, the build. Similarly, you can do that with a client. So if a client is uh, requesting resources from a server, we can go and get the server in production, check that the contract in production matches or is backwards compatible with the contract from the client. Uh, again, use the same, same tool, um, just different swaggers. Um, and then the community is calling this phrase called consumer-driven contract testing. Um, that's the third way of doing it, uh, where you can record some tests. So you write some automated tests, unit tests, using something like Cucumber or Gherkin. Um, and you record the interactions that your consumer has with uh, something called Pact, uh, which is basically just a mock server. And then from those interactions, what you do is you replay those interactions against your provider. Um, so that's another way of, of checking that your contracts are, are good. Um, it's worth saying the, the contract testing side of things is very useful for checking that contracts are accurate. It's not so useful for semantics. So if the service has changed what the actual method means, uh, what it actually does is that's obviously where you need some slightly different kind of testing, generally integration uh, testing. Um, so I'm just going to go skip straight through because we'll come on to one of the questions that was in the, the chat a, a second ago. Um, and this is the idea of distributed transactions um, and lots of different ways. Uh, but first, a transaction, what is it? It's a set of operations that you can consistently and atomically either reverse or, or, or commit, roll forward. And even in a single service can be uh, quite, quite hard. So if you're using a tool like RabbitMQ, uh, as well as a database like MySQL or MariaDB. Uh, Spring, pretty common uh, industry standard. Uh, it uses a best effort one phase commit. So it doesn't even guarantee you that both things will commit at the same time. Uh, what it does is it uh, ensures that the transaction commit and the RabbitMQ commit are very, very close together so that if there were to be a network failure, it'd be very unlikely to happen between the two. And so every engineer should have their um, their hairs raised on, on their skin there because that doesn't sound super efficient, uh, super safe. Loads of other people have tried to tackle it. You've got two-phase commit, uh, three-phase commit. No one's really come up with, with very good answers that are, uh, are foolproof. But that, that problem gets worse in uh, microservices because by default, HTTP is the worst uh, type of protocol for transactionality. And if we just illustrate it here, um, the order service has just talked to the account service. Um, you don't know if the account service, if there's a failure and nothing comes back to all the service, you don't necessarily know whether the account service got it. You don't know whether the account service got it and did something with it, but failed to return something. Um, or you don't know if the network failed on the response. And so you never got a response from it. Um, but the account servers did actually end up committing something. So there's three types of failures here straight away. Um, and so async messaging um, tends to be a little bit easier, um, but um, they rely on this concept of eventual consistency and idempotency. Um, so if we revisit this one with asynchronous message, it looks very, very similar. Uh, you don't really get a return path generally, uh, but your message broker, so that's RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ or Kafka, it will ensure that a message that goes from the order service to the message broker is committed with this bit that I mentioned, the kind of best case one face commit. And so if the message doesn't get committed, then the order service knows that it can roll back its own database maybe. If it does get committed, it just assumes that the account service will uh, deal with that. Um, now that's where it's called eventual consistency because if I look at the 
uh, platform as a whole, the order service database will be out of sync with the account service database. And so you need to architect your platform in a way that that doesn't matter. Uh, and sometimes it will. So the UX might have an issue where the UX refreshes may be slightly too fast and it looks like there's an order, but perhaps your balance hasn't been decreased yet. But in this case, the account service, uh, because of the, again, the Springs um, two-phase commit, uh, sorry, uh, best uh, one-phase um, best case commit, uh, it will uh, pick up the message. It does its stuff with the database. When it's ready, it commits the database and straight after to it, it acknowledges the message from the, the broker queue. Um, so yeah, so this bit we've mentioned. And so using async messaging, you do that. With HTTP, you just generally won't be able to do that. Um, gets are good. Anything read-only is good through HTTP. Um, but ensuring that a post, an update or um, an insertion or delete has actually gone through is going to be incredibly difficult. Um, and then the other uh, side, and th this does help HTTP a little bit, is the idea of idempotency. So the idea of idempotency, whether it's for HTTP requests or messages, if you're building your system in a fashion that you can call it multiple times and it will have no impact for subsequent processing, uh, so you won't be double counting, um, then you're on a winner. Um, and a lot of queues and systems uh, these days work like that. So Ram and queues got two bits. It's got queues and topics as well as streams. The streams part is at least once delivery. AWS SNS is one stream uh, is once delivery, and Kafka is also at least once delivery. And so in those cases, you need to cater for the fact that uh, one of those platforms might send you the message multiple times. Um, but the good news there is then you don't need to use transactions. So you don't need complicated transactions. You don't need to rely on Spring to um, have that you know really close transaction commit and rabbit queue commit because if something does get replayed. Um, then uh, you're good to go uh, because you've built it so that uh, you can do that. And typically that involves some kind of recording that that message or a message ID or something related to the message has already been processed in a downstream service. I could probably cover quite a bit more in terms of saga patterns and stuff, but I don't know, I don't want to abuse people's time. So I'm happy to either take questions or continue. Maybe if there are uh, questions, uh, then we can go with questions for what you have right now. I, I guess maybe if I want to turn it around a little bit, um, you, you uh, Land Bay, you've been established for several years now. Uh, but if you, if I can ask you to cast your mind back to the very sure. beginning, um, and when you were coming up with the first version of what you, whatever you're doing, that's the state that most of the students' teams uh, would be in now. In about five weeks' time, they're due to hand something in, which would be like an MVP, and they're kind of graded on that, right? So, what? You, you you kind of touched upon the idea of shortcuts and being um, able to choose the right kind of shortcuts is being is, is one of the important things. So what kind of shortcuts or what kind of strategies would you suggest for for them, given yeah, this think... highly artificial way of um, that that we have to go into because it's a it's a course which which lasts a term. Yeah, and so I think my. My main, I guess a couple of bits, keep it, so there's a common acronym, we always refer to it in Land Bay, um, keep it simple, stupid. Um, it's very, very easy to go overboard when you first start, and then you realize a month from now, actually you didn't need this, you didn't need this, you didn't need that. Um, yeah. Focus on, focus up front on those bits that are going to be shared, uh, whether that's the build system, whether that's security, um, work out how you're going to do that up front so that you don't have to revisit every service because one person went one way, one person went another way. And I think finally, if you're if you're doing microservices and you're building something for two or three months, um, just embrace the pain because it should be quite painful because microservices are more designed for larger scalable systems than they are for two, three month throwaway sort of things. And so this is probably a chance to um, to adopt some of the things like 
you know, the, the solid pattern, which I'm sure has probably been mentioned uh, somewhere. Um, uh, read through the slides on, on Saga, which around, um, you know, orchestration or choreography, how are your services going to talk together in order to, to work out something? Uh, write down together um, if you're each doing different microservices and you've got a feature to build together. Are you going to more go towards something has happened and people react to something has happened, or are you going to more go down the, the, the line of, I'm going to tell other services to do this? Uh, typically, it's one or the other. Um, and typically, if you do half of a half, it doesn't quite work. So microservices does require a lot of um, design upfront um, mm -hmm. and hopefully very little code afterwards. Um, but the, the complexity of microservices isn't in the coding. The coding generally is, is quite easy, and you'll, you'll get up to that, whether you're learning Spring, Spring Boot, Caucus. Use one of those frameworks to, to leverage all of that. The, the hard bit is to make sure that when you're reading your use cases, your features, etc., that it makes sense when you jump from one service to another when you're troubleshooting. Um, yeah, that'd be my my top tips. Could I could I ask you to um, also go back to this question about message queues and um, communication between services using message queues versus using an async REST API? Um, yeah. Um, one of the uh, patterns that you have listed in in this list that you have here? Yeah, absolutely. So, so in the case here, um, REST calls or GraphQL or whatever it is, um, they're, they're not great because you can't guarantee for an update that something's happened. So even an async REST API, which typically isn't quite um, async anyway, but um, you're, you're firing and forgetting, um, but actually you never quite know whether the account service has received uh, that request or what might happen with it. Whereas an asynchronous message uh, being sent, so long as the message broker, whether that's Kafka, ActiveMQ, RAMQ, doesn't really matter which, it confirms it's received the message, the order service commits it. That's the massive advantage here that you've got. So you can, you can guarantee that at least on the left-hand side, eventual consistency-wise, the order, the order service makes sense. Um, and it's now down to the account service to, to process the message. Um, and if we if we look through some of the, the stuff around uh, the sagas, one of the uh, the patterns is to have retriable messages by default. So typically you might try message five, six, seven times and then give up. But the idea being, if you look at your queues and they're empty, then your system is probably consistent. If your queues aren't quite empty and stuff is being processed, it might not be, um, it might not be, consistent but it will eventually be consistent and so by using messages you just avoid the issue of um, network failures or having to have compensating transactions so maybe the order service checks later to see if account has actually done its work and if it finds it hasn't it has to revert the order those kind of things get really complicated because you have to rebuild everything twice you have to build the forward flow and then you have to build a compensating flow and there's very good reasons that you might want to go down that route but with a message broker, okay, there's a bug, account service can't process the message, you fix the bug, you reprocess the message, you move on. Um, so the, the benefit of asynchronous message is that. The downside is you don't get a fast feedback to the user. So the order service, the order has been placed, uh, but if there's no money in the account service, perhaps the account might need to do something with it and then alert the yeah. customer at a later date. So there are different um, advantages to, to some, but certainly, if you're doing something transactionally and you need to ensure things work, um, then uh, it's not going to be a, a leveraging um, async messages almost a, a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any other questions, burning questions for Chris while we have him here? Um, we almost got to the end. There you are. Um, there's a bit of summary, but um, yeah. if yeah. you do have questions <laughs> afterwards, do um, do look me up. I put a couple of bits on on cloud native bits in there that you can uh, read up on. But um, yeah, and obviously, if you're interested in what we're doing at Land Bay, then um, do get in touch. That's great. And are you able to share these slides with us? Yeah, with yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll send it to you straight after this if you want. Yeah, then I'll, I'll post it to the the sorry learn, which is where we store all our learning materials this is fantastic i mean it's totally on topic i think so thank you so much for your time um 
Um, Very welcome. I, I really useful for the students as well. So let's um, thank the usual way. It's a little bit harder to do in in virtual, but maybe we can we can embrace the virtual world with um, something like that. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thanks. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time, everyone. I hope that was useful. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye bye.